You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Who Did What Now, the history podcast that is not your history class. With me, Katie Charlewood, your one-year-older host... (laughs) birthday girl and reader of books. So it was my birthday a couple days ago and I had, I had the best time. I had the absolute best time. It has literally been such a long time since I truly enjoyed a birthday and oh, I stayed in the most amazing hotel. Um, But if you get the chance If you're in Edinburgh and you want to stay in a boutique hotel that is absolutely amazing and ridiculous and you have your own butler, go stay in the House of Gods. I cannot recommend this hotel enough. They were absolutely amazing to me. I had some issues trying to like organise stuff um, through like some of the technical stuff because I am like, I'm okay with technology, but I'm not super with stuff. And they managed to sort a bunch of stuff out for me that I really needed. And honestly, they have been absolutely fantastic every step of the way. And it is one of the most beautiful places I have ever stayed in. Yes, absolutely amazing. I had the best time. And then I I saw my cousins that I hadn't seen. And well, no, I saw them during the summer. Like, but um, like I'm trying to do better when it comes to family because I've got such a habit of like disconnecting myself. Like, part of it I know is from, like, the ADHD um, and the anxiety and and all that stuff, but... And it's so easy to become separate and to become your own thing, especially when, like, you grow up and you go in different directions. But luckily for me, my cousins are cool. And I got to make some TikTok friends, which was really exciting. Because that's the great thing about the internet. Like, you can connect everywhere. And I want to thank everyone who's been leaving your... uh, your, your, your po- Apple podcast reviews, they have been awesome. I, I actually charted in Ireland again for the first time in a good while, which was like really exciting for me. And that's the thing about reviewing. When you review, when you say something, when you give the five stars and you say something about the podcast, it actually helps boost me up the charts. And it, it's basically from a business end, it's so like... But anyway, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, quit your jibber jabber. In fact, me. In fact, you, I will. But first, we gotta get our source on. So, this week, we are discussing a horror story left out of the history books Clipperton Island. So, our sources are Clipperton, A History of the Island the World Forgot by Jimmy Skaggs. Bibliography, the Ile de Clipperton, Ile de Passion. Uh, Journal de la Société des Orsionistes uh, by C. Just. The Clipperton Island Case by Edwin D. Dickinson. And also The Clipperton Project. We also have Squallowdivers.com, DamnInteresting.com, and AtlasObscura.com. So Clipperton Island is like this tiny island just off the west coast of Mexico. It is ridiculously remote. This wee island in the East Pacific is difficult to reach. The land is basically barren. There is no fresh water. And it has really dangerous reefs, like, all around it. For the most part, people generally forgot that Clipperton Island, you know, existed. I mean, it's really interesting to, like, I don't know, people who like animals? Because it's got, um, birds and crabs and, you know, I assume fish because it's a fucking island, but hymns to say. So for the most part, Clipperton is generally ignored. The island itself was originally discovered by Alvera Saavedra Theron in 1528 on an expedition commissioned by renowned fucking arsehole Hernán Cortés, the Spanish conquistador. Basically, they were trying to find a route to the Philippines. They found this instead. Anyway, they ignored it. By 1711, it was rediscovered by the French. So Martin de Chasseron and Michel de Bocage, they draw up a map of the island and they claim it for France. And in 1858, France basically officially claims the island. And you're thinking, okay, 
So the Spanish and the French are eyeing up this island. Why the fuck is it called Clipperton? Well, I'm glad you asked, because I'll tell you. It's named after John Clipperton, an English pirate and privateer. Um, and he fought the Spanish in like the 1700s. And because the area was known to be a bit treacherous, they say that he used it as like a base for his raids because nobody would ever want to get fucking near it. Anywho, so in the mid to late 1800s, a bunch of places are trying to claim this island. The US tried to claim it under the Guano Islands Act of 1856. Napoleon tries annex it as part of the French colony of Tahiti. So in 1897, the French navies travel and past and they're like, what the fuck is that? There is an American flag on that island that's definitely ours. They go over there, there's three fellows working for the Guano people and they're like, mate, what the actual fuck? And they say, listen very carefully, I will say this only once. And, um... <laughs> No flag. No American flag. The US authorities have to denounce this act. Like, oh no, mate, we didn't really mean to. But like, a month later, Mexico send in a gunboat to annex it and be like, no, actually, this is our island. Sorry, France and United States of America. This is our island. Now piss off. And then like, a colony is established. And, like, a bunch of military governors are posted there. And in 1906, the last military governor was Ramon Arnaud. And you're probably thinking, why are people really interested in this really tiny island in the middle of nowhere in the East Pacific? See, the thing is, it was really valuable because it was covered in shit. So let me tell you about Clipperton. So basically, the island doesn't really have any native, like, plants. There's not really a lot to this island. It doesn't really have any natural vegetation. So coconut palms were introduced in like the 1890s by the guano miners. But like other than that, it's kind of like grass and thickets. Not not exactly um, useful. What the island does have though is a bunch of animals. So it's got geckos and skinks, which are reptiles. These bright orange crabs called the Clipperton crab, called the Clipperton crab, which is you know, pretty cool. You got a crab named after you. Good for you. But most of all, it has a fuck ton of birds. What kind of birds, Katie? Well, I'm going to tell you because some of the names are really fucking hilarious. So they have white terns, masked boobies, sooty terns, brown boobies, brown noddies, black noddies, great frigate birds, coots, martins, cuckoos, and yellow warblers. But not only that, docks like to visit every now and again too. So it's got... It's got loads of birds. Why are you telling me all about these birds? So not only are the names of the birds incredibly humorous, it also, it's also what made the island so attractive. Why? The reason Clipperton Island was such a valuable property was because it was covered in shit. So you've got thousands of years of compacted seabird droppings, which are worth their weight in gold. Uh, because as we know, what does poo do? Fertilizes. It makes very good fertilizer. So in 1906, the British Pacific Island Company acquires the rights to guano deposits there. They acquired the rights to collect shit. In conjunction with the Mexican government, they build a mining settlement and also erect a lighthouse under the orders of President Porfirio Diaz. Oh, also, so basically 100 men and women were deposited on the island. Um, that's like men, women and children. Effectively, the men were sent first and then their wives and children followed. And because, you know, there isn't really a lot of, you know, food or like animals or supplies, pigs were introduced, but um, pigs are smart and don't really want to be eaten. So mm, there wasn't too many of them able to get. And so their survival actually relied on supplies coming in from Acapulco, Acapulco, Acapulco every two months. So, you know, they're, 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 you know, mining their guano. The colony was really at its best about 1910. So at some point between the Mexican Revolution kicking off and damn First World War happening, everyone just kind of forgot about Clipperton. And without any explanation whatsoever, ships just stopped coming. Thing is, this community was absolutely dependent on 
So the residents of this practically inhospitable island, they were absolutely dependent on the mainland for like food and information. So like they had no idea about either war, like no fucking clue. And their supplies are just dwindling. So there's a shipwreck on the island in 1914. It's an American ship. You know, the rescue for them comes pretty quickly. So they're like, hey, we'll take you to safety and offer us to take, you know, the islanders to safety. And uh, Ramon's like, fuck this for a game of soldiers. Um, No, I do not want to do that because he's convinced that this is some sort of trickery, some sort of ruse to basically capture and claim the island because it's still a disputed territory. He decides to just expel every British person from the island. So he sends the last British man and his family away with the Americans. And the other islanders, they vote to stay with Ramon Arnaud. Which, um, needless to say, was a terrible fucking idea. Needless to say, supplies start getting very scarce very quickly. So the months turn into years, and by 1915, there are 26 people left on the island. You've got 13 soldiers, and then 12 women and children all together. And also, one dude who had barricaded himself in the lighthouse, Victoriano Alvarez. Food-wise, food wasn't really in abundance for the islanders. Basically, they had a couple of coconuts that would sort of drop each week. Their main sources of nutrition were birds, bird eggs, and fish. And this may surprise you, but there isn't exactly a lot of vitamin C in a coconut or in a brown booby egg. So, yeah. And as time progresses, the islanders start dropping like flies, especially the adult men who are succumbing to scurvy. They keep dying, so they have to bury them really deep in the sand to basically make sure the crabs don't eat them, which is... You don't want to see a crab eat your friend. I mean, I can only hope the Clipperton crab is not as terrifying as a coconut crab because those things are fucking terrifying. Have you seen a coconut crab? I never want to be within at least six feet of a coconut crab. There should be at least one moose between me and a coconut crab. Those things, no. No. I would rather deal with a moose than a coconut crab. And moose are scary too. I don't even like horses that much. I think they're terrifying. So it gets to the point where there are five men left on the island. All of them suffering from malnourishment and vitamin deficiency. And they've only got one boat on the island and they they don't have enough fuel to take it all the way over to Acapulco. And they know they can't row it because everyone's fucking sick. So Captain Arnaud sees a passing ship in the distance and thinks, all right, we're going to do it. And he's like, right, okay, this is our chance. So he convinces three other soldiers to join him in a rowboat um, and try and row over to this ship in the distance to get help. And so they head out, they're rowing out towards this distant ship. But the waves are so powerful. A bunch of the wives and Raymond's eight-year-old son who are watching them go and hope, hoping that they're going to save them, that they're going to find help and save them. And as the men are desperately paddling away, the sea swallows the boat. The islanders left watching that watch the boat and the men vanish between the waves. And you're thinking, this has to be the lowest point. No, no, no. We're going to go deeper into this basement of despair. It gets worse. A few hours later, a hurricane appears offshore. And between, you know, the loss of her husband and a fucking hurricane coming towards the island, Captain Arnaud's heavily pregnant widow goes into labour with her fourth child. So all of the women and the children, they take refuge in this sort of basement in the Arnaud's house. And during a hurricane on a practically abandoned island in a cramped basement, Alicia Rovira Arnaud gives birth to a son whom she names Angel. And to prove not everything is so fucking horrific in the world, both mother and baby survive. But when the storm clears, the islanders come up from the basement and their homes and the buildings are fucking destroyed. And at this point, there were no men left on the island. And at some point during this chaos, the lighthouse door finally opens. And out comes Alvarez, the only adult man left alive on the island. 
Alvarez, who you may remember earlier as the lighthouse keeper who basically hid the fuck away, goes down to the shattered remains of the settlement, collects all the guns, and chucks them in a fucking lagoon, saving one for himself, you know. And in a completely rational move, declares himself king of the island. So Alvarez, the the king of Clipperton Island, and he begins this. I know you're going to be surprised to hear this, but he is a horrific fucking tyrant. And so begins Alvarez's reign of terror, in which he enslaves, murders, and rapes the women and children. He basically used them for whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. And one mother and daughter who refused to obey him in a show of power and fucking insanity, he points his rifle at them, rapes them, and then shoots them. And because, you know, at this point time is an illusion and everyone else basically, at the very least, gets beaten by this man, over the next few excruciating months, Alvarez uses and abuses. Being a part of a royal family might seem enticing, but more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else, like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes even your head. Wondery's new podcast, Even the Royals, pulls back the curtain on royal families, past and present, from all over the world, to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. From icons like Grace Kelly, Oscar-winning actress turned Princess of Monaco, who the world saw as the ultimate good girl. She mastered playing a happy wife and mother, but beneath it all, she was desperately lonely. Grace spent her whole life working towards perfection, and it ultimately cost her her happiness. Or King Ludwig II from Bavaria. He was only 18 when his father died, leaving the crown to him and a duty to rule that he never wanted. He refused to lead and used the funds from the royal treasury to further his extreme love of opera. But this choice eventually cost him the crown and his life. Follow even the royals on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge even the royals ad-free right now on Wondery+. Plus whichever person he wants. When he's bored of the 20-year-old Altagracia Quiroz, he moves on to 13-year-old Rosalia Nava. And when he's done with her, the 20-year-old Teresa Randon. Alvarez kept most of his threats for the captain's widow, Alicia Rovira Arnod. And he constantly told her that he would kill her the moment anyone from the outside world showed up because he knew damn well she was going to fucking tell about everything he did. And this disgusting cycle continues for, like, two years. And for some reason, the only adult woman he hadn't gone after was Alethea Rivera Arnaud. Why is it with lighthouse keepers doing mental things, though? What is it about a lighthouse that just drives people bananas? So basically, mid-July 1917, Alvarez is just... He's bored with the three... I don't want to say women, because one of them is a fucking child. She's 13. I don't know, she must be like 15 at this point, I think. But still a fucking child, so... Mm -hmm. And he decides to set his sights on the last remaining adult woman for who he hasn't touched so far. Alethea Rovira Arnaud. So when he forces Tirza back to, back to, you know, the settlement at gunpoint... He informs Alicia that she's going to present herself at his hut by the lighthouse the following morning. So, 18th of July 1917, it's the morning time. Alicia heads towards the lighthouse with her seven-year-old son, Ramon Arnaud Jr., accompanied by Teresa. So when they get there, Alvarez is just chilling, he's roasting a bird on a wee spit he's made outside the lighthouse. And he's happy as Larry until he realises that Teresa is there too. He's like, what the fuck are you doing here? And as he's trying to shoo her away, she runs directly into, into the lighthouse keeper's hut and grabs a hammer. Alicia gives her this like signal and she runs toward Alvarez and whacks him with the fucking hammer. Two hands, just <laughs> big swing. Tirza is just swinging this hammer at Alvarez and Alicia sends her son to run to the hut. And while Tirza is, and while Tirza is swinging at him, Alvarez manages to grab an axe and he starts chasing after Alicia, who is yelling at her son to grab his rifle before he can get his hands on it. And as Alvarez is chasing after Alicia, one last swing from Tirza 
gets him right in the head and knocks him to the ground. So Alvarez is quite probably dead at this point. However, Tirza just isn't done yet. She is overcome with emotions, you know, because she's finally having some power over her abuser. And although Alvarez is quite probably dead at this point, somebody manages to grab a knife and they are stabbing and slashing and beating him. Like, some might call it overkill, but I think they just really wanted to make sure he was absolutely fucking dead. And frankly, he deserved worse for what he did. As they stand over the frankly mutilated body of the dictator of Clipperton, little Ramon notices something in the distance. Something the islanders have not seen in at least two years. A ship. An actual ship. Basically, this gunboat, the USS Yorktown, was patrolling patrolling sort of the coast of North and South America because there were rumours that the Germans had established a secret radio and submarine base in the, in the Pacific Ocean. And in a crazy random happenstance, Clipperton, Ireland is, is on Yorktown's route. And in their minds, this wee island with a colony and a lighthouse would be a perfect hiding spot for the Germans. So the USS Yorktown circles the island, but like, it's a massive fucking gunboat, so they try and send this small boat ashore. But because, you know, the island is treacherous and there's dangerous coral reefs. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention, there's sharks. That is shark infested water. So, mm, mm mm-hmm. Nobody wants to be going in that. So the women and children on this island, they see a flicker of hope, only for it to be extinguished. And this just brings down the whole mood. And this is effectively the last straw for the women on the island. And after seeing this boat retreat, the women have a serious conversation about what they're going to do now. And the plan is to end their lives, to just stop the suffering. And the main issue they're trying to work out is whether they should just shoot themselves or let themselves drown in the lagoon. Luckily, it doesn't come to that because... The American ship makes a second attempt to get their boat to shore. And the second... So, when the Americans arrive, Alicia meets them and basically explains that they need to get off there now. Like, they need to get out of there yesterday. So the crew take the woman back to the settlement to collect, you know, whatever left. And the others go and investigate the lighthouse and see the body, effectively. The Americans notice that all of the children are small you know, are all small for their ages because, you know, they're suffering malnutrition. And the two-year-old Angel Arnaud, he's got rickets, which is so severe he can't actually walk. So he is carried to the boat by an 11-year-old boy, Francisco. And these sailors take the remaining survivors of Clipperton Island, which are three women and eight children, back to the USS Yorktown. And they leave Alvarez's body for the crabs. Oh, also in addition, furthermore, the captain of the Yorktown, he's like watching these people on the island get into the boat with the soldiers and he's like, what the actual fuck? He's like well suspicious because he's convinced like danger, danger, high voltage, you know what I mean? But once he's informed of what happened, he's like absolutely 100%, let's get these ladies back home. So the Yorktown basically stops, you know, hunting for German U-boats for a wee minute and sets sail for Salina Cruz, Mexico. Um, Because basically, because a few of the survivors had relatives there. But not only were they doing that, they sent a message over the wireless to the British consulate in the city, you know, to try and get help locating relatives. And like on their ship, all the sailors, they get like really close to the kids. They're like, they get really fond of the kids, which is like hard not to after all the shit they've been through. So the ship anchors on the 22nd of July, 1917 at Selena Cruz. And serendipitously, this boat appears carrying none other than Felix Rovira, Alicia's dad. So like over the last however many years, he had been like consistently questioning Mexican authorities, like where the fuck is my daughter? What's happened? But he had been told over and over again that all of the colonists on Clipperton had died. So Felix Rovira is reunited with his daughter and his four grandkids. And the sailors on this ship are so, like, moved by this, like, family reunion. They, like, burst into tears. And, like, the crew, and as well, which is, like, so cute, 
the crew did a whip around and they collected like a fund to, you know, help, you know, the survivors like start a new life because obviously they had absolutely fuck all. The locals heard about this. And they were so grateful to, like, the American sailors. They, like, they threw a big party for them. Effectively, for the most part, Clipperton Ireland hasn't really been inhabited by anybody. Like, except for, like, the odd castaway or, like, some military stuff or scientific expeditions, like people studying birds and shit. However, in 1980, 70-year-old Ramon Arnaud Jr. revisited Clipperton Island with a team of biologists led by Jacques Cousteau. But yeah, no one has settled on Clipperton, Ireland since, since that. And you know, you can't really blame them, to be honest. And so ends our tale of Clipperton Island, which is basically like the real um, Lord of the Flies situation. If you liked my retelling of this horrific tale, uh, feel free to um, like and review five stars. What? Apple Podcasts. Woo! Put me up them charts, yo. I'm so sorry. That was, I mean, I'm not going to say you like the story. I like the retelling of the story because that is a horrific story, let's face it. So, honestly, the, the reviews, they really, really, really help. And some of them, you guys are funny, actually. You leave some really amazing reviews. They really cheer me up. So, what did we learn today? Um, no amount of bird shit is worth settling in an inhospitable island. Coral reefs have been defeating the French since 1868. Um... Crabs will eat you, if given the chance. They don't give a fuck. If the opportunity arises where you get the option to be king of an island, um, don't be a fucking tyrant. Because you will get your skull smashed in with a hammer. And you'll deserve it. Okay, so... And of course, it is that time of the show. I was going to say time of the evening. It is the time of the show. Where we have recommendations time. Reading. I am going to recommend... Going with the theme, I'm actually going to recommend, you know, um, what I call a good for her book. It's a a whodunit. Um, I'm going to suggest you read Gone Girl by Gillian Flynn. That is my reading thing for the week. Go enjoy. Listening. I'm going to recommend a podcast called Tenfold More Wicked. It is historical. It is true crime. it It is beautifully done. And I actually have two watching recommendations. One that I've already seen and that I'm going to see. So I watched uh, the second season of Tiger King on Netflix uh, because I'm here for the drama and I fucking love it. Uh, So watch that and I'm gonna get emotional. (laughs) I always get emotional talking about this. In Ireland we have a show called The Late Late Toy Show. Um, It happens once a year. It's usually the last Friday in, in November uh, because it's leading up to Christmas. There's the Late Late Show, which in, like America has its own thing, but the Late Late Show has it's hosted over here by a man called Ryan Tuberty, who we call Call Tubbs. I don't enjoy Tubbs. He is I, I find him like a he's not really a joy to watch on the screen. Except the only time I can uh, tolerate him is during the toy show. There's always the joke um, running on Twitter about him doing um, like lines of coke before each show because he has to be so full of energy. Like, the man cannot sing, he cannot dance, but he gives it loudly, he goes for it, and I am 100% here for that. And also, the toy show is like this glimmer of hope in everything horrific. It is a, it is a, it's in its 13th year here, and it is like a national institution. So they do this special show, kids come on sing, the kids, like, do toy reviews, and... Like, they talk about it properly. Like, they're like, you like this? I'm like, nah. And there's always one farmer kid. And we have a rule with the toy show. You do not insult the children. You can make fun of tubs or any celebrity that shows up as much as you like. But you leave the children alone because the amount of amazing stuff this show does. Like, it, what, before tubs came on board, basically, it would be the kids of the people who owned the toy company and were related to the advertisers and stuff. Like, they would be the ones who got to come in and play with the toys during like this special segment they come in and play with all the toys and what Tubbs did instead of having that happen he ensured that children from the nearby hospital and hospice come in and play for the toys for like a couple hours giving them like some kind of joy <clears throat> getting emotional now every time I think about it it makes me cry I love the Late Late Toy Show. It's amazing. I'm probably going to do a mini-sode on it because 
You know what? I want to. It's going to be really fun. You, if you hear that cat, that is Riley. Riley! Don't mind Riley, he's nurse. Oh, this is the cat that went missing. Let me tell you about this before I go. Which is like a mile away. Mmm, anyway, that's neither here nor there. But with that, I'm gonna... You shush. Do you want some treats? Do you want some treats? I bought you treats. Okay, some treats. I love him, really. What can I say? What can I say? I'm a sucker for a broken meal. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. So with that, I'm actually gonna bid you adieu. So adios. Au revoir. Au revoir, my friends. Bye-bye.